Hi and welcome to Premium Builds, I'm John. Clearly we've hit the big time because Intel have offered us their brand new flagship CPU, the i9-11900K for review. We're really interested to see how this CPU performs, particularly in the light of leaks around the performance of the i7-11700K, and also up against its competitors. For that reason, we're putting it up against the Ryzen 7 5800X, which is also an 8-core high-performance CPU with multi-threading, and the outgoing CPU that's at the top of the tree, almost, it's the i9-10850K, a CPU which has been available for as little as $320 recently, and it has 10 cores and is also very high performance. Intel have been lagging behind in the CPU wars for six months now. They've been unable to challenge AMD's Zen 3 lineup for raw performance, and didn't have features like PCIe 4.0 support. The new 11th generation Rocket Lake CPUs aim to address that, and Intel are making some bold performance claims. This i9-11900K CPU boasts 5.3 GHz peak boost speeds using thermal velocity boost, 8 cores and 16 threads. It uses the new XE architecture integrated iGPU. But it suffered a convoluted development, originally scheduled to be released on a 10 nanometer production process, then backported to 14 nanometers when that failed. This then is the end of the line for this architecture, this node, and this socket as far as Intel are concerned. This should represent the pinnacle of their current capability, so we're eager to find out what it can do. Before we dig into the numbers, I want to explain our test methodology. I want to make sure that this test is fair. For that reason, we've controlled every variable possible. All the synthetic and gaming results you'll see are obtained with the same RAM settings. Indeed, the same kit of RAM. We've used an up-to-date BIOS, released just six days before this release, and we've used exactly the same motherboard for both Intel CPUs and a B550 motherboard for the Ryzen 5800X, the MSI Mortar. For all the gaming and synthetic tests, we left it to use the standard settings, that is to Intel's specification, for multi-core enhancement, power limits and thermal velocity boost. We did this because to our mind it's comparable to how we've tested the 5800X using PBO. Both CPUs were allowed to perform as they do with minimal setup, according to manufacturer's intentions, but with the automatic optimizations in place. It's also the default behaviour for this motherboard. We verified this behaviour with AB testing and a number of metrics, and with both our RAM settings and motherboard settings, the results you'll see are representative of this CPU performing at its best, outside of more involved manual tuning or overclocking. RAM was set to 3600MHz CL16. There's also the issue of Gear 1 and Gear 2 memory controller settings, analogous to Ryzen's Infinity Fabric and memory controller speeds. These tests are running Gear 1, with the memory controller speed matched to memory speed. We'll touch on that later and dive into more depth in a separate video, which I'll link here. Also, please check out premiumbuilds.com. This is the kind of research we do to ensure that we're recommending you the very best builds at any price point. We're making major revisions to the site, updating it with a build database that will ensure that you get a compatible and high performance PC at a minimum cost. Let's take a look at our test system on the Intel side. We ran both of the Intel CPUs on a high-end motherboard, the Asus ROG Maximus 13 Hero. It's a Z590 motherboard, and we updated the BIOS with the most recent 0605 update, which is just six days before this release goes live. With 14-phase 90-amp VRMs, this motherboard is an overclocker's dream, and we found it very flexible in terms of memory settings as well. We used the Fractal Design Celsius Plus S28 280mm AIO cooler and an Ion Plus 860W Platinum power supply. We're not sponsored by Fractal Design, we just know that their components do the job well. For RAM, we've used our Samsung BDI 4400MHz CL19 kit, but run it at 3600MHz CL16 in order to match as closely as possible the settings used in our Ryzen testing. For the GPU, we've used the EVGA RTX 3080 XC3 Ultra, but run our test settings in order to expose the CPU performance as much as possible. This powerful and consistent GPU helps us do that. The Ryzen comparison system is identical, with the exception of using an MSI Mortar B550 motherboard. First, let's take a look at the synthetics for comparison. Cinebench R20 is a basic test of single and multi-core performance whilst rendering a scene, and it's almost entirely independent of memory speed, so it's raw CPU performance we're looking at here. We've averaged three runs for these results. In the multi-core tests, you can see that the 10850K and the 5800X are neck and neck, both ahead 100 points at 5990 to the 11900K's 5860. The four point difference between the 10850K and the 5800X is imperceptible, but remember that the last gen Intel CPU has 10 cores, not 8. Looking at the single core performance again, averaged over three runs, we can see why. Both the 11900K and 5800X score an identical 624 point average, whilst the 10850K lags 100 points behind with a score of 516. This result is close enough that silicon quality or the cooler setup could influence the numbers a little way, but overall the Ryzen 7 CPU, the 5800X, wins this testing in Cinebench R20. 
Using Blender to render a couple of scenes, we get another view of the rendering capabilities of these CPUs. Note that shorter bars are better here, indicating less time taken. Different scenes favour different aspects of a CPU's performance, and in this test we can see that for the classroom render, the 11900K and 10850K are neck and neck at 435 seconds, but the 5800X wins this one about 20 seconds faster. In BMW 27, the 10850K takes the lead at 135 seconds, the 11900K is 8 seconds slower, and the 5800X finishes last in this test at about 20 seconds behind that. Overall, there's no definitive winner here, and I always feel obliged to point out that we're using this as a test of the CPUs, and if you're actually looking to do 3D rendering, you should look at a GPU which will accelerate this process massively, and will be an order of magnitude faster than any of these CPUs. Moving on to gaming-oriented benchmarks, here are our 3D mark results. Focusing in on the CPU component of Firestrike and Time Spy benchmarks, these tests do bring memory performance into play somewhat, and also heavily favour higher core counts as it's a parallel test that uses all cores. The 11900K places last in Firestrike 500 points behind the 10850K and 2000 points behind the 5800X. In Time Spy, it splits the difference between the two competing CPUs, falling in the middle with a score of 12,540 points. So rounding out our synthetic testing, you can see that the 11900K has a high single core speed, manages to match the multi-core speed of the other two CPUs in some workloads, but it doesn't win out and it's not the winner of this suite of tests. It's struggling to make its mark here. Moving on to the core of this review, here are our gaming results. We're running at 1080p here, but not artificially low settings or resolutions to find differences you'd never see in the real world. These are realistic and do indicate actual gaming performance for these CPUs. Call of Duty Warzone is our first test and we run a five minute battle royale against bots to provide an overview of performance, not a snapshot. We're at 1080p high settings here. This game is a mix of CPU and GPU performance and you need both to achieve really high frame rates even at 1080p. You can see that the 10850K and 11900K perform almost identically here. They're within a couple of frames per second of each other on average, scoring just over 200 frames per second, and they're also very close on the minimum and maximum metrics. The 5800X is the clear winner though with stellar performance and 240 frames per second average. It's disappointing that we're not realising a generational performance list in this test. Rainbow Six Siege hands another clear win to the 5800X, using its internal benchmark which we found to be very consistent. Here, the 11900K falls about 20 frames per second behind the 10850K on average, but is 60 frames per second, over 10% behind the 5800X. Obviously all three CPUs develop very high performance, but it's a shock to see Intel's latest offering unable to beat either its six month old rival or even its last generation offering uh, in raw gaming performance. Doom Eternal is also a very well optimised game, and logging 2 minutes of playtime and looking at the statistics generates these results. The 11900K and 10850K perform nearly identically here again, with the 5800X clearly in the lead, with 384 frames per second average compared to 340 frames per second for the 10850K, and 335 frames per second average for the 11900K. Moving on to the more demanding AAA titles, Shadow of the Tomb Raider has an exceptionally consistent inbuilt benchmark, and it gives you a breakdown of raw component performance, including the CPU game engine performance. It's those numbers that we're looking at here, to completely isolate it from GPU performance. You can see this is a close run thing. The 10850K is marginally behind, the 5800X is marginally in front on average. In reality, it'll be your GPU that dictates performance in this game, but we're seeing a trend in performance emerge now between these three CPUs. Moving on, Red Dead Redemption 2 hands another win to the Ryzen 5800X. Again, it's surprising to see the newest CPU bringing up the rear here, 15 frames per second on average behind the 5800X and slightly behind the 10850K. And finally, the game that's most dependent on CPU power here, Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. To generate these benchmark results, we run an AI flight over Manhattan taking off from LaGuardia and log three minutes worth of statistics throughout. GPU utilisation stays under 70% here, and performance is ultimately dependent on CPU performance. Here we see the 11900K outperform the 10850K across the board, delivering 61 frames per second on average. That's not a bad score by any means, but the 5800X once again beats it at 63 frames per second average, although performance is slightly less consistent with lower lows, 1% lows and 0.1% lows. Intel made bold claims in their launch presentation about the 11900K's performance, stating it was capable of beating the 5900X by 11%. It's possible that this is the case in other tests or different circumstances, but in our benchmark tests it's not winning out, it's 4% behind and this is against the 5800X with 4 fewer cores. So rounding out the game testing then, and to conclude, we're in an interesting position here. We're very used to seeing the most recent CPU beating the previous competitors, especially when we're talking about the flagships.
Here we've got the 11900K actually struggling to match even the 10850K in some tests, and certainly falling short on average performance from the 5800X, a CPU which is nearly $100 cheaper and nearly 6 months old. Moving on to memory performance, there's been some discussion online about Gear 1 versus Gear 2 settings for RAM on these CPUs, and also there's the mantra that Intel CPUs aren't as dependent on RAM speed as Ryzen. We wanted to run some tests to see if we could find out more about that. It also helps explain how we arrived at our memory settings for these benchmarks. We'll touch on this now and cover key points, but if it interests you, please see our linked video, which digs deeper into the effects of memory latency on performance for this CPU and the i9-10A50K. Firstly, Gear 1 and Gear 2 are simply the full or half-speed memory controller ratios for the CPU to control RAM. Much like Ryzen's U-Clock, setting this controller to half-speed induces latency, and that latency induces a performance penalty. Let's take a look at a couple of A to B tests in our most consistent benchmarks that demonstrate this effect. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we can see that Gear 1 offers a slight performance bump a few frames per second in each metric. There's a slight detriment to the minimum frame times, but not significant. And in Rainbow Six Siege, we can see the same small performance increase from a shift to Gear 1, but it's not a marked difference. This small impact has been verified by other reviewers. RAM speed also has its own impact on latency. To demonstrate, here's a series of run of Shadow of the Tomb Raider's benchmark at different RAM frequencies, but timings retained at CL1616, 1632, up to 3600MHz, and CL17 at 4000MHz for stability. We're running Gear 2 throughout here because Gear 1 wasn't stable at 4000MHz. Remember, this CPU is only officially rated up to 3200MHz, or a 1600MHz memory clock speed. That's because the actual RAM clock speed is half the transfer speed. You can see how the performance gain is significant, but it peaks around 3600MHz and tails off at 4000MHz because we have to loosen timings to maintain stability. The detriment of running 2400MHz RAM is serious, and this data challenges the notion that RAM speed is unimportant to Intel, or even less important than Ryzen. It clearly makes a big difference to performance potential. This is why it was, we felt it was vitally important to give the i9-11900K the same advantage as the 5800X, and as it happens, that occurs at very similar RAM settings, 3600MHz CL16 and Gear 1. Overall RAM latency clearly has a big impact on this CPU's performance. If you'd like to see a more in-depth analysis of this, including data from the 10850K, please watch our linked video where we'll dig into the numbers more. We've got plenty more data that demonstrates the seriousness of RAM performance on the overall performance of this CPU. Power draw and the consequent heat output have long since been the cost of performance on Intel's 14 nanometer CPUs. We ran a couple of tests to explore this on the 11900K. Probably the most illuminating result was using the all-core load in Cinebench and toggling thermal velocity boost to ascertain its effects on both CPU temperature and power draw. These numbers are reported by Hardware Info 64, total package power and temperature, and in both cases with the 280mm AIO turned up to full speed. The first run to the left shows behaviour with the thermal velocity boost enabled. You can see that stock power limits are enforced and the CPU regulates power to 250 watts. The Asus motherboard allows this behaviour in its default configuration. All cores sit at around 4.7 GHz and the CPU does a good job of holding temperatures at 70 degrees C. In the second run to the right, disabling thermal velocity boost actually allows the CPU to disobey power limits to achieve and maintain as high clock speeds as possible, and it goes pretty wild, drawing up to 330 watts and hitting its new target of 90 degrees C before backing off the power and clocks to prevent overheating. Before that, a few cores are hitting 5.1 GHz, with most at 5 GHz or above. As a result of overriding the power and thermal constraints, it scores 6,042 points versus around 5,900 points in the first run, where the lower power limit is enforced. I want to highlight that this second run is very much a gloves-off approach. It, to demonstrate the levels of power and temperature you're going to be dealing with if you do seek to manually overclock this CPU, it's not the default behaviour. The first run is much more indicative of normal behaviour and power draw, although in most cases after TOR, the time limit expires, the package power will drop to 125 watts for extended full core loads. Another result of note we found when using Cinebench R20 in an all-core load is that switching the all-in-one cooler from an automatic setting whereby it ramps speeds with temperature to simply having it running full blast the whole time yields about a 100-point improvement on average in the Cinebench R20 score. This really highlights the importance of proper cooling on this CPU. You can enhance performance just by keeping temperatures lower and allowing the CPU itself to lift boost clocks as a result. The power draw of this CPU, though, can get pretty insane. You're going to need a top-notch motherboard, certainly at least in the $250 range with strong VRMs, and also a very good cooling solution to draw that heat away. So in conclusion then, where do these results leave us? Well, we have to say we're a little disappointed with the performance of this CPU. We've become used to each generation of CPU flagship comfortably outperforming the last, but in our tests, both gaming and multi-core work, 
we can see that actually it struggles on occasion to even match the outgoing i9-10850K, and that's not even Intel's old, old flagship product. It certainly doesn't live up to the Ryzen 5800X in most metrics, a CPU that's $100 cheaper, six months older, and is now finally coming back into stock to be readily available. Let's not pretend that Intel haven't tried. They're used to the top dog position, and if they could beat AMD, they would. Zen 3 CPUs were released six months ago, so there was a clear target to aim for. And in the synthetics, we can see that they've matched the core performance like for like, but you can't ignore AMD's offerings of the 5900X and 5950X for multi-core workloads. Ultimately, I think what we're seeing here is the consequences of the limitations of that aging 14 nanometer process. At 10 nanometers, perhaps this CPU would have run cooler, more efficiently, and at higher clock speeds. Perhaps it would have had less cache latency helping gaming performance. But that's not the case. Intel have laid it all on the table, and this is it. Then we come on to the real issue, which is pricing. This is a $539 product. And not only that, but you need to pair it with an expensive motherboard, I'd suggest at least $250 worth to get VRMs that are going to be capable of supplying it, and a substantial cost for the cooling system you'll need to keep it running at good temperatures as well. When you compare that to the fact that the results we obtained in this test uh, on the 5800X are with a $150 motherboard and a $100 AIO, you can see that there's a substantial cost to opting for the Intel generation this time around. That's all well and good if the performance is there to justify it, but if cost is in any way a consideration for you, then it wouldn't be wise to look at the 11900K. This 11th generation of CPUs from Intel needs to be viewed as what it is, a stopgap bringing PCIe 4.0 compatibility to the market whilst they wait for Alder Lake to come on stream, which they've still touted towards the end of this year, although there's every likelihood that may be pushed back. It's also the end of the line for this process and this architecture of CPUs, so this really is everything they can squeeze out of this process, and this is the performance we see. For that reason, and with my preliminary testing, although I haven't dug into it a huge amount in this review, the overclocking potential of this CPU I believe is quite limited and simply results from cooling it by sub-ambient methods or with a very aggressive cooling system and putting as much power as possible into it, whilst managing temperatures through voltage regulation, you'll probably be able to get maybe a 5.2, 5.3 stable all-core overclock, and I'm sure the extreme overclockers will be able to push it much higher than that, but that's not really relevant to real-world use or the value of this CPU, that's overclocking for its own sake. I think we can safely say we're past the days of being able to crank another half to one gigahertz out of a CPU and get a 10 to 15 percent uplift in performance simply for the sake of adjusting some settings in BIOS. Intel have had to use that headroom on this chip in order to provide the base performance that we see here. Another area that I haven't really looked into is the performance of the integrated GPU and this is a new um, iGPU architecture and it has some really impressive scores in transcoding and encoding workloads. So if you're building a PC specifically to handle that kind of work, uh, a Plex server or something of that nature, you'll be well placed to look at the CPU performance in those metrics and see if you can build a really efficient and high performance transcoding system with one of these CPUs. However, it doesn't really impact gaming performance where of course you're using a discrete GPU. Finally, Asus released another BIOS just five days before this release, um, a day after the BIOS that I conducted my uh, refresh testing with. This claimed to enable adaptive boost technology specifically on the 11900K. And from Intel's diagram on that, you can see that that lifts all core boosts where possible to a higher level. However, I don't believe it will actually have a significant impact having logged metrics throughout the all-core testing I did. We were seeing boosts of around 5 gigahertz during those tests, and the CPU was self-boosting to high levels anyway. Ultimately then, if you need a PCIe 4.0 compliant platform for high-performance computing, you'd be better off looking at the high-end Ryzen parts, the 5900X or the 5950X, which offer that and more multi-core performance with a lower startup cost. If you want a very powerful CPU but you're on a bit more of a budget, then Intel cater for that at the moment with the 10850K. And there's also the 10700K, which is a fantastic gaming CPU. From our own test results and from the leaked results of the 11700K, it looks like you'll get almost identical performance from the 11700K, but at, at least $100 less. If you want the best gaming CPU, then the 5600X from AMD is still the go-to performance CPU for that. And also the Intel 10600K has great gaming performance and again is discounted at the moment and available at low prices, so snap those up if you can. The lack of PCIe 4.0 won't make any difference to your experience in those cases. Overall Intel it's a nice try, but sadly this CPU just isn't good enough to be attractive at the price. Nice box though, it's really swish. I hope you found this video useful and informative, please like and subscribe if you did. Also, please check out premiumbuilds.com. This is the kind of research we do to ensure that we're recommending you the very best builds. 